Okay, so let's look at Revelation chapter 3. So now we're going through the seven churches right here. All right. I don't think that I mentioned this before, but Sardis means red ones. Sardis means red ones. So that's the church where we're at. We first covered Ephesus. Then we covered Smyrna. We also covered Thy uh, Pergamus. Thyatira. Now we're in Sardis. We're going to eventually cover Philadelphia. Now remember, for the church in Sardis, it can go up to 1700. It can go 1500 to 1700. Oops. This is according to Larkin's calculation. And then Dr. Ruckman, he instead puts it earlier, where he puts it at 1,000 to 1,500. I explained the reasons for the, both of those dates. I'm not going to explain it on this one. So Sardis, it means red ones, red ones. During that time, it was definitely a, a day and age where there was bloody persecution, so to speak. And the torturous inquisition was infamous that time. Especially if you study the Spanish inquisition, that was the worst type of inquisition. And it was contemporary during the time of Sardis, where, they re where things really got red and bloody. So we saw the, the previous persecutions under Thyatira and then Smyrna. And then Sardis would, as well, continue its persecution in red, bloody persecution. Some of these stories you should definitely read in Fox's Book of Martyrs. It will definitely convict you and inspire you. One of these people, his name is Savonarola. And Savonarola, he would actually preach against the Pope and the wrongdoings of the Catholic Church. So one time, these uh, group of bishops and priests came by to him, and they said that, uh, they're willing to give him a cardinal's hat. And then Savonarola said to them, if I want to take a, a cardinal's red hat, I'll take a red hat of blood instead. So truly, it was a red bloody day and age. And then they held him to his word. So then they tied him against the stake and they burnt him alive. And then they said, I separate you from the church of Rome while he was burning. Savonarola, he said this, you can separate me from the church down here, but you can't separate me from the church up there. That's what he said. So the, in more accurate terms, he exactly said it this way. The church militant, yes. The church triumphant, no. So I don't know if you remember my teaching on basic doctrine, basic discipleship on that one, on the church. The church is known to be two stages, church militant, church triumphant. Church militant is a church down here. See, that's what he was basically saying. Church triumphant is a church up there. Okay, so that is Sardis during this time period. And remember, it was a dead day and age. But look at verse 4. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. Despite of being a dead church day and age, that's why it was known as Dark Ages. See, it was a dead time period. Despite of that, they had a few names who were still alive, and they did not defile, they did not corrupt their own garments that they were wearing. So the names, you saw Savonarola over there. You can also include Wycliffe, Huss, and then Luther, and then you can include Erasmus, Peter Waldo, and etc. These people stood up against the Roman Catholic Church at that time period. So during this time period, they stood up against and they prevailed against the devil's system that time. It mentions they did, uh, they did not defile their garments. Okay, what does that mean? They're wearing garments that they don't sully? Look at the next part. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So these people are worthy enough that they're clean in garment, white garment, that they can walk with Jesus in white garments. Okay, 
In a Christian application, what this means is this. So, apparently, we Christians, our righteousness, our righteousness. That's important to understand. This is not talking about Christ's righteousness for our salvation. Because our white garments is going to depend upon our own works. This is not going to be dependent completely upon the work of Jesus Christ alone. So then, in other words, this has nothing to do with your salvation, this white garment. This white garment for Christians, so let me put Christians right here. Now we don't confuse this with tribulation saints. Christians, when we wear white garments, it's going to be founded upon this aspect. Look at the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. So notice that the bride of Jesus Christ is wearing garments, white garments. But notice how you keep yourself white, how you keep yourself unspotted, unwrinkled, unblemished in your garments. Look at the book of Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> and then we'll read verse 26. We'll read verse 26. We'll look at Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll read verse 25, actually, just to follow context. Verse 25. So you notice right here, it's the relationship of the bride of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ himself, husband and wife. The bride of Jesus Christ is obviously the church here. And notice right here, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the who? Church. A lot of people ask, who is the bride of Christ? Well, that's, the Lord, uh, that's referring to the church. Some hyper-dispensationalists tried to not make it so. I'm not saying all, but some of them do. But you've got to realize this. It's not a Jewish thing. This is a Christian thing. A Christian church is the bride of Jesus. And gave himself for it. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now notice right here that when we receive this white garment, unblemished, it's dependent upon the cleansing of the word. As the Bible says at the book of John, Sanct uh, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So how is your life abiding by the word of God? So depending how well you abide by the word of God, then your garment's going to be clean. What's going to happen then with those blemishes? Look at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to look at the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What you're going to notice right here is that your work... Now remember what the Bible says at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 mention that God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So there are good works and bad works. So how well are your works for Jesus Christ? Do you have bad works in your life? Then that's going to be a problem, right? Then aren't we going to be judged and cast into hell fire for our bad works? No. So... Abiding by the word of God, our work will be dependent. It will be abiding by the word of God. And then there's going to be obviously good and bad. So then how is Jesus Christ going to present himself a church without having spot or wrinkle? By washing it with the word. Here's the idea. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Every man's work, see that, shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So there's going to be a fire at this judgment seat of Christ, we call it. At the judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be a fire. There's going to be that day. These works are going to be cast into the fire, and it will test if it's good or bad right here. Now notice what happens. If you're good in your work, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. See? So you get a reward if it's good. If it doesn't abide, if the work is bad, 
Notice, verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. See? So loss. But notice right here, you are not burning in hell. You, the fire has no touching on you. Amen. Keep reading. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. See that? So it's only your work is burned. It's not you, your soul. <clears throat> now, let's also turn to the book of Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. That's why it makes sense Jesus Christ can now present to himself a bride, the church, without spot or wrinkle at Ephesians 5. Because why? She went through a cleaning process right here. Okay, so now let's look at the book of Revelation chapter 19. We're going to read verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the what? Marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife, see, that's us, hath what? Made herself ready. Oh, now she's ready. See that? That's proof the bride had to go through some preparation process right here. Why would she be made ready? Because of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Notice if she's ready, that's why verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. See that? That's your white garments. But look at these white garments. It's not referring to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Keep reading. For the fine linen is the what? Righteousness of saints. That's your righteousness. There is no doubt that you will be going through a process, a preparation process, where God has to test you for your righteousness. Look at Revelation chapter 2. This is uh, Revelation 3. This will really prove it now. Look at Revelation 3. Look what he says to the church of Laodicea, which is interesting. He didn't say this to other churches, but Laodicea, for some weird reason. Look at verse 18, Revelation 3, 318. This verse is utmost proof that all these verses that we looked at, 1 Corinthians 3, Revelation 19, and Ephesians 5, they all match up. Look at this, Revelation 3.18. I counsel thee to buy of me what? Gold tried in the fire. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 3? If your work is good in the fire, you're going to have gold, silver, precious stones. Remember that, 1 Corinthians 3? Keep reading, that thou mayest be rich. But it's not just that, and what? White raiment that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Wait a minute, then that means, Pastor, if I don't have enough righteousness in my garments, my righteousness is small, that means I'm going to be naked. Yeah. So you're telling me there's going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be wearing probably nothing. There's, we're going to see a bunch of naked jailbirds at the millennium? Probably, yeah. Because your, your righteousness depends on your garments right there. So that's the reason why. Why does God make it more naked, though? So that it can be more shameful. And then when you have shame, then the Lord can give proof to people, see, this is a child that has not been serving me well. That's going to be something right here. So that's why you got to realize this, is that you better make sure that your righteousness is really good. Otherwise, we're going to see a lot of naked people at the millennium. I hope that's not going to be our church. All right, go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. One of our members, you know, is naked. Hey, what happened to your clothes, brother? Oh, it's hanging in my closet up in my mansion in heaven. I just didn't wear it yet, you know. But I have it, I have it. <laughs> All right, Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh, if you overcome, see, that's a tribulation phrase again, right? The same shall be clothed in white raiment. So this means then, the tribulation saints, they're also going to be receiving this white garment as well. Now notice the verse behind it, for they are worthy, right? So it may sound like right here, as reference to tribulation saints who are working for their salvation, and they have to prove that they are worthy to walk with Jesus, if you look at the previous verse behind it. So they're going to be found worthy walking with Jesus. If they don't, then they can be cast out. The 
the parable that Jesus talked about concerning the wedding, he talked about people dressed in white garments who are able to participate in the wedding, but one of them was not wearing a white garment. So then Jesus said, friend, you know, where's your garment? And then the person didn't answer, and the Lord cast that person into, uh, into hell after that. So you see right here that this white garment thing could be dependent upon a salvation issue, but it will not apply to us. Why doesn't it apply to us? Because remember, we don't burn in the fire, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But for tribulation saints, it can be for them. Because remember, their salvation is different from our salvation. I'm not going to repeat it again, but remember... Christian salvation under the church age today is faith alone, not by works. Tribulation salvation is faith and works, which should be very obvious because you have to resist temptation and persecution from hell itself. And when you're starving to death, you can't give in to the temptation and sin. But we got so many Christians today who are denying Jesus Christ already and who are not willing. Did you ever dedicate yourself to Jesus Christ, I'm willing to go through torture, pain for you, Jesus. If you didn't, then according to tribulation salvation, you're not really saved. So obviously that salvation does not apply to us. Otherwise, pretty much uh, everybody maybe, I hope not, I hope a lot of people dedicate themselves, but if you're not there yet, then nearly all of our church lost our salvation, including onliners. <laughs> okay, so let's keep reading right here. And I will not blot out his name out of the what? Book of life. So that's definite proof this has to do with salvation right here. So notice right here, your name could be written in the book of life, but then erased. And what I mean by your name, not you, but tribulation saint. Now, if some smart Alec wants to try to use this verse to make you Christians doubt your salvation... There's an easy answer to that. You just simply answer dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, remember, means rightly dividing verses to the right group of people, right time period. Meaning then, this verse applies to tribulation saints in the tribulation timeline, not Christians in the church age. But if you want to use this verse as a Christian application, you can argue it this way. You can argue this way that actually this verse is not a threat, because the verse did not say, I will blot out his name. It says, I will not blot out his name. So this verse is not a verse that threatens your salvation. It's a verse of assurance, confirmation, that God will say, I will never erase your name from the book of life. That sounds like eternal security right there. See that? So you can use it in that aspect. But remember, there's a double application. So a doctrinal application, we can see this would be referring to tribulation saints. So if they continually walk in white garments in their righteousness, their names cannot be blotted out. But if they don't, then the name could be, notice right here, blot out, erased. Moses mentioned that to God. He said, if uh, you can't forgive these people, the Jews' sin, then blot out my name. So notice that the book of life, it can be erased right here. So that can be a doctrinal application. A Christian application is, it is impossible. We are eternally secured. We have the assurance that our names are written in heaven. We are a new creature in Christ. You might say, how do you know that, Pastor? Because 1 Corinthians 3 showed you that you will not burn in hell even if your works are bad. Not only that, our work is founded upon the work of Jesus Christ. He did all the work. Absolutely none of our righteousness. If any of our righteousness will have to count, it's going to be relating to fellowship, not to salvation. Okay, let's continue reading Revelation chapter 2. The next part. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So notice right here, if this tribulation saint overcomes the Antichrist day and age, his name will also be confessed before God and the, his angels. So you want to uh, mark that down because... There are verses in the book of Matthew where Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before my father and his angels. If, you don't, if you're ashamed to confess my name, I'm going to also not confess your name before my father and before his angels. And people infamously use those verses to prove that Christians can lose their salvation. 
But those words that Jesus used match perfectly with Revelation 3, 5. Remember, what is the book of Revelation? What time period is that? That's the tribulation. Revelation is about end times prophecy, not church age. So you can put this as a doctrinal application saying that since this is a doctrinal application to tribulation, this is obviously a tribulation thing, not Christians. So when Jesus said about denying me and confessing my name before men, that is referring to tribulation Jewish aspects. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Because, we're not going to turn to those verses, but if you look at Matthew chapter 25, Jesus did not confess their name. Jesus said, I never knew you. And Matthew 25, and that was a tribulation parable. Another example, look at the next part of, uh, was it Matthew 25, I think? Yeah, I think the next part of Matthew 25 so the first part was a parable. The second part talks about Jesus Christ coming down on his throne. And he said that you took care of me. So then he confessed their name before men. But then the other people, he denied their name, saying that you did not take care of me, Jesus said. And people said, when did we take care of you? Or when did we not take care of you? And Jesus said, it's because how you treated these brethren. And if you treated these brethren well, you treated me well. 